cancel culture isn't new. Well, not entirely. There's no denying that the advent of smartphones and Twitter has played a huge part in online outrage. It's also true that internet mobs behave differently from their off-world counterparts. But for the most part, excommunicating people for violating social norms is part of human nature. The inevitability means it will be with us forever. There is good news though. Cancel culture has happened so many times before that there are plenty of world examples to help you escape its clutches and plenty of lessons to help you understand how this hive mind works. However, be warned, just like evolutionary biology, council culture adapts. New words are coined, old arguments are given a makeover, and sooner or later, a new target is chosen. I love it, I'm Did above they, it. They try to counsel you like 15 times. <laughs> is huh? it? I'm love it, I'm above it. <laughs> <laughs> so heed these lessons from humanity's past if you don't want to become a persona non grata. It's time to learn how history works as we present a historical guide to surviving council culture. Ostracism was an official practice during 5th century Athens. In 487 BC, Cleisthenes introduced a vote to see which citizen would be expelled for 10 years. The idea was to safeguard democracy by expelling those who might rise up to become tyrants. If you refuse to leave, you are put to death. On the plus side, your property would be maintained for your eventual return. But until then, you were physically banned from the city walls. Bear in mind, life was harder back then, so being kicked out of the city-state more than likely meant having to fend for yourself in the wild, especially if no neighbours wanted to take in a troublemaker. And who was the first person to be kicked out under Cleisthenes' bold idea? Cleisthenes! Well, according to one ancient historian, anyway. Strangely, it didn't have the stigma one might think. After a while, you would be allowed to move back in as if nothing had happened. The practice didn't last long, though. The last person to be exiled was the politician Hyperbolus, who was kicked out after trying to manipulate the vote to remove his enemies. The story goes that this made Greeks disillusioned with the practice, which proves that the silent majority do exist. But getting booted from your home is nothing compared to being tortured and tried in a kangaroo court. The Spanish Inquisition made a name for itself in 15th century Europe, with hundreds of thousands of forced conversions. They were seeking to remove heresy from the land, no matter the cost. Yet, it was their structure and organisation that set the Spanish wing aside from the other Catholic Inquisitions. Initially, each tribunal would have two inquisitors, but new positions were added as the institution matured. Growth was facilitated by confiscating money and goods of the denounced, effectively making a pyramid scheme from hell. As you might expect, doubting the validity of the Inquisition's claims was proof of heresy, and no sins would be pardoned except for the sins of the Spanish Inquisition, who forgave themselves because they were doing the Lord's work. So, if a self-righteous, dogmatic underling is saying you're evil because you have questions, just remember that your chance of being found innocent is pretty slim. The nature of truth and the right to criticise the very core of cancel culture, so it's no surprise to see gaslighting as a common tactic. Nowadays, we're all familiar with the process of psychologically manipulating people into believing a falsehood. For Ignaz Simmelweis, he would literally be driven insane by the denials of reality around him. The 19th century Hungarian physician was an early pioneer of antiseptic procedures and was pretty much the guy who noticed that washing your hands with soap tended to make you less sick. However, his research went against the prevailing medical narrative at the time, despite his in-depth studies on the correlation between cleanliness and declines in child deaths the medical establishment decided that his obsession with not having dirty hospitals was too eccentric to be taken seriously. The indifference from his medical peers outraged Simmelweis, and he'd lash out against his critics in open letters. But to his detractors, this just proved he was nuts. The gaslighting did not yield, so all this did was push friends away. He was shunned, mocked and humiliated. He began drinking. His family life fell apart and he was eventually sent to a mental institution. But is it any surprise? When people are denying clear evidence in front of you, it will play with your emotions. So save your breath to save your sanity. Paranoia is a consequence of council culture because you don't know who's against you or who's out to get you. 
During the 40s and 50s in Hollywood, a blacklist was created to deprive anyone of work if they were a member of the Communist Party or an alleged member or refused to assist the congressional investigations into the party's activities. Whatever you might think of communism, there's a big difference between being a card-carrying member and being accused of being a card-carrying member. In fact, most people on the list were simply moderate or liberal, at least by today's standards. The names of accused actors, screenwriters, producers and the like were compiled into a pamphlet so that those in the industry could know who not to hire. Undoubtedly, some of those driven out of the industry were innocent people. And all it did was create a culture of mistrust amongst friends and colleagues. Good thing people in Hollywood nowadays have abandoned guilt by association and would never campaign to force people out of showbiz for their alleged political leanings. Right? But what's the problem with a little bit of gaslighting and paranoia? Surely you can reason with the right people. Well, as the creators of Monty Python's Life of Brian found out, there is no point throwing pearls before swine. It might be hard to believe, but this gentle poke at the biblical era was X-rated at the time, and theatres cancelled screenings after pressure from boycotting protesters. Maybe that sounds familiar. John Cleese and Michael Palin tried to put the controversy to rest by appearing on a BBC television programme to debate with two prominent Catholic journalists, Malcolm Muggeridge and the Bishop of Southwark, Mervyn Stockwood. Yet neither could prepare for how dishonest their religious opponents were. Not only did their critics refuse to listen to their arguments, they hadn't even seen the entire movie. Can you imagine that? Both Muggeridge and Stockwood arrived to their movie screening late, therefore missing the opening scene where it is clearly set up that Brian is not Jesus. But did this dissuade them from claiming they had mocked the Messiah? Hell no. By what name are you calling him? Ah, uh, Brian! We worship you, O'Brien. So the next time you're talking with someone who hasn't read the article, seen the film, or even understood your argument, just remember, you can't reason someone out of a position they didn't reason themselves into. Don't worry though, because today's controversy will be tomorrow's overreaction. Just don't expect the mob to understand this. Look at what happened to counter-culture comedian Lenny Bruce. His obscenity conviction was finally pardoned in 2003, 37 years after his death. So what was this freedom of speech test case that saw the writer and performer frequently arrested and monitored by law enforcement agencies? It was a performance in 1961 when Lenny Bruce said, well, it's not a family-friendly word, but it rhymes with sock chucker. He even got handcuffed for saying the word schmuck, which was, at the time, a naughty word for a man's genitalia. These bad words lost him paid work and it got him barred from entire countries. But the real punchline is that by today's standards, all this isn't a big deal. The type of language that got Bruce dragged before the courts are common parlance on social media and YouTube. But that's the thing about offense. It's only offensive until something more offensive comes along. Another thing that is timeless is the use of children as a basis for mass hysteria. Not to say that the previous generation never thinks the current one is the worst. Even Socrates said, children now have bad manners, show disrespect for elders, contradict their parents, and tyrannize their teachers. But isn't it interesting how so many moral panics come about because of someone Thinking of the children, the Salem witch trials tore apart a community with false allegations of witchcraft. More than 200 people were tried and tortured over a year. In total, 19 women and 5 men would be put to death in gruesome ways. But the authorities didn't think the accusations were false. Why should they? The accusations came from children, and they were backed up by adults. It couldn't possibly be that the entire scandal was based on a simple lie from bored children and credulous adults. Yet it was. And it would be based on a lie again during the 20th century when the satanic panic rolled around. Crazy as it sounds, there were over 12,000 unsubstantiated claims of satanic ritual abuse in the USA throughout the 1980s and 1990s. The hysteria spread through families, schools, law offices, doctors' surgeries, local government, you name it. And it was a trending fixture in television and film possibly satanic messages on some rock 
music recording. Just like the witch trials, the panic sprung from the dubious testimony of children. But unlike the witch trials, this time there was rigorous police investigations. The first real case was the McMartin trial, where a family-run preschool was accused of hundreds of devious acts, many of which were actually physically impossible to perform. Law enforcement discovered that children's stories didn't add up. There was conflicting evidence, falsified testimonies, coached kids, delusional parents. Everything was fueled by lies and distorted by gossip. There were even prison inmates who invented witness testimony in the hope of cutting down their prison time. Of course, some of the people involved may actually believe this stuff happened. After all, there are cases of people confessing to crimes they didn't commit, so it's not unthinkable that a mass hysteria could distort a person's memories and perception of reality. Take these incidents as proof of the power of social contagion, and keep in mind that sometimes the mob doesn't even know it's lying. Given all of this, you can't blame people for thinking that appeasing the mob will get it to go away. Surely, apologising is the quickest and most effective strategy to get everything to go back to normal. But you would be wrong. Never apologise to the mob. All it does is make things worse. Don't believe us? Ask Salman Rushdie. Once the Life of Brian controversy had died down, society was looking for the next religious thing to brand problematic. Then along came the Satanic Verses, published in 1988 from a respected Indian-born British author. The magical realist book about Indian actors uses part of the life of the Prophet Muhammad as inspiration, but for some far-right Muslims, the mere reference to the Quran was blasphemous. What ensued was book banning, book burning, effigy burning, and the Ayatollah Khomeini placing a hit on Rushdie's head. It gets worse. People turn their back on Rushdie. Politicians threw him under the bus for causing offence, and the author Alan Le Carre penned a letter victim-blaming Rushdie. Even the singer Cat Stevens, now known as Yusuf Islam, said on television that he welcomed Rushdie's death. Of course, none of the rabid mob had actually read the novel, or if they did, they hadn't understood it. Not that it mattered, people were out to kill Rushdie. They even murdered the Japanese translator of the book, in what is logically the endpoint of cancel culture. Bookstores pulled the work from their shelves, but kept other books once deemed dangerous. Rushdie was forced into hiding and needed 24-hour protection. Under those circumstances, who amongst us wouldn't say sorry? But when Rushdie released a statement apologising for any offence caused, the issue didn't go away. It was used as proof of his confession that he knew what he was doing. The book is still banned in Muslim countries, and in 2022, 34 years after the initial upset, a man stabbed Rushdie to fulfill the fatwa against him. The attacker wasn't born when the book was published, and he later admitted that he only read two pages from the novel. There is one final thing to consider when surviving council culture, and it can be found in So You've Been Publicly Shamed by the journalist John Ronson. It was released in 2015, right when the phrase council culture was entering common vernacular, but the standout story concerned what happened to Justine Sacco in 2013. She started that year as a PR executive, but ended it as patient zero for the modern version of council culture. Just before boarding a plane, she tweeted a joke to her poultry Twitter following. But by the time she had landed, a mob was waiting for her at the gates, and she'd been hounded from her job. The joke was this. Going to Africa, hope I don't get AIDS. Just kidding, I'm white. Now, Suko is not a stand-up comedian, but it's clear that this attempt at South Park-style satire was trying to say something about white privilege. Ironically, it's the exact type of joke that would do well on a 2023 chat show hosted by Trevor Noah or John Oliver. So Suko's problem wasn't the tweet, it was the calendar. If she had waited 10 years to tweet that, she'd be seen as a hero. It just goes to show that council culture is capriciousness camouflaged as compassion. But what's your experience with council culture? Share your anecdotes below. Just be sure not to reveal your name and location. If you liked this video, then check out our other one on the Kim family of North Korea. When it comes to censorship, they're on another level. Share this video with a fan of freedom of speech and leave us a like if you'd want more videos like this. Don't forget to subscribe because we'll be back very soon with a new video all about how history works.